それでは OECD の教育事業の責任者でもいらっしゃいますシュライヒャー局長どうぞよろしくお願いいたします。おはようございます。Good morning. When I listen to Mr. Minister Shibayama talking about Society 5.0, I just realized again how challenging it is to educate children for their future and not our past. To educate them for jobs that have not been created, to use technologies that have not been invented, to solve societal problems that we can't even imagine. Today, the reality is that the gap between what our societies demand and what education systems produce is actually becoming wider, not narrow every day. One of the things that we do at the OECD is to track the quality of learning outcomes, how fast are our education systems moving. And in a field like science, which is so fundamental for tomorrow's world, we started this in 2006. 2006 is a long time ago for most of us.、It、happened to be the year before the iPhone was invented. We didn't have smartphones that changed everything in those days. Twitter was still、uh, sounds, the Amazon still a river, but you take an education system like Japan, one of the most successful systems in the world, highest performing on most international comparison. And、you can see progress has just been quite limited between 2006 and 2009, and the world didn't stop in 2009. Remember, that was the year when maps became dynamic. Google Maps, cars became electric, starting to drive without a driver. And again, progress in education has been modest. And if you think about what happened between 2012 and 2015, now you can think about robotics, cloud computing. Biogenetics, big data, no? huge changes in science and technology, and education is not keeping up with those, even in the most successful systems in the world.、No? If you look elsewhere in the world, you know you can see, for example, here the United States. You see the same tendency, flattening outcomes at a lot lower levels of overall quality.、No? Europe, similar picture. A rapidly changing world in education, keeping not pace with those developments. Fortunately, there are some examples of education systems that have been pushing the frontiers and moving forward. Now, who would have thought in 2006 that you know the small, poor country of Portugal in Europe would keep progressing and surpass? The average of the European Union, or you can look to Singapore, moving from good to great, and some regions in China I cannot even put on the map here. So there are some examples of success, but the overall picture is we need to accelerate progress in the quality of learning outcomes. Now, and it's not just about time. You know, the first thing that we always hear is, "Oh, the results are not so good. Let's add one more hour of science, or one more hour of mathematics, or one more hour of history." Actually, as you can see here on the chart, there are huge differences in the hour of of time that students spend learning. In blue, you see the time they spend learning in school. In yellow, they spend is the time that students spend learning at home or at tutoring. Lots of things. And you can see, for example, in the United Arab Emirates, students spend close to 60 hours of learning. A huge volume of time being invested in learning. In Finland. Is only a little bit more than half than that, 36 hours per week. Huge differences in the volume of student learning time. But when you look at productivity, you can see in countries like you know Finland, Germany, Switzerland, Japan, students learn a lot in very little time. Whereas in the United Arab Emirates and many other countries, students spend a lot of time, but they learn very little. It's not about just Increasing the quantity of time is about learning differently. How we use this most precious resource of student learning time in our countries, and changing this is never easy. There are many obstacles. The status quo in education has many protectors. Sometimes we, as parents, are part of the problem, not the solution. Now we 
get very anxious when our children learn things that we no longer understand, no? or when they no longer learn things that were so important for us. No? Teachers often teach more how they were taught themselves than how they were taught to teach. No? And as a policymaker, you can lose an election over education, no? because when things go wrong, you get blamed for it. But you rarely win an election over education because it takes so much longer than an election cycle to translate better ideas into better outcomes. Changing the world is really, really hard. But we need to do that. If you think about the future, one thing that we know is that there's going to be a lot more people in the global middle class, a lot more people knocking on the doors, asking for better education, who have the resources to actually look for this. But the downside of this is that we see a rising inequality as well. In the OECD area, the 10% top earners are now earning 10 times as much as the 10% bottom earners. Now. Why do I say this here? Because it all ends up on the doorsteps of classrooms. Now. Classrooms are becoming more diverse, more heterogeneous. And not just in terms of you know, social disparities, the world is also becoming more diverse through global flows of people, migration big shifts in the diversity of our populations. Volatility. We spend more and more and we save less and less. And that only goes up to for some time. And this chart is a good symbol for the times in which we live. We put a lot of resources, public resources, and consumption in the things that help us today. We actually put very little in the future. And education is one of those. Japan is a good example. You know, Japan spends a lot on consumption on welfare today, and actually relatively little on its long-term future education. But it's true for many countries. And then, of course, digitalization. We have now more broadband connections in the OECD area than we have people. And that's fueling the rise in artificial intelligence that Minister Shibayama referred to, which pushes us to think much harder of what makes us truly human. How do we avoid educating second-class robots and really develop first-class humans? What are the knowledge and skills that actually complement the artificial intelligence of computers, not substitute it? You can see that in our data from the OECD, you can see the majority of young people say they feel really bad if they are not connected. Being part of the digital world is like, you know, drinking water or breathing air for young people these days. And we also see that the kind of things that are easy to teach, easy to test, have become easy to digitize, to automate. The things that are becoming less relevant have to do with routine cognitive skills. Thinking that we can memorize something and that's going to help us later in life, that works less and less. Because the modern world no longer rewards us just for what we know. No? Google knows everything. It rewards us for what we can do with what we know. No? It's about agents, about its activity. No? You can also see, and that's the green line on this chart, social skills are rising in importance. No? Our schools are designed for individual learning. Now we put students behind individual desks, and at the end of the year, we test whether they are better than their neighbor. But what the world rewards more and more is co-agency, the capacity of people to collaborate, to connect, to work with each other. Big changes in the world. And some people have called this a race between education and technology. You know, before the big industrial revolution, neither technology nor education mattered for the vast majority of people. That was something very remote for a few elites. But then came the Industrial Revolution, moving technology ahead of people, and it caused huge amount of social pain. Those who lived during those times had a very, very hard time. But you know, it was also the time when we started to invent universal public schooling, making people compatible with the norms of the industrial age. Educating people in batches of age, making them compliant with the norm of the industrial way of working, and it created generations of prosperity. But we haven't changed things very much since then, and now we have the digital revolution. That puts everything into question. That makes the things that are easy to teach easy to digitize. And we can see the same phenomenon. Technology is rising ahead of the capacities of people. And we're starting to see, you know, even university graduates, graduates having difficulties finding good jobs. And at the same time, employers say, 
We cannot find the people with the skills they need. So the question is, how do we actually move people again ahead of the technologies of our time? That is the big challenge of our times. If you think about you know, society 5.0, Technology has been incredibly democratizing. Everybody can collaborate, everyone can contribute, connect, and so on. But technology has also concentrated power at a rate that we have never seen before. Technology has been incredibly particularizing. The smallest voice can be heard everywhere. You post something on Twitter and anybody can follow you. But it's also been incredibly homogenizing. Squashing individuality, cultural uniqueness. It becomes much, much harder to preserve identity, agency, purpose. Technology has been incredibly empowering. You know, there's no better place to see that than right here in Tokyo. The big inventions are changing the world. The most successful companies these days have the product before they have the money. They are started with a big idea, not with a big industry. As individuals, we can change the world these days. But we also see the other side of this, and which is the incredibly disempowering force of technology, where algorithms are starting to understand ourselves better than we understand ourselves. Where we, be, we become the slaves of you know, computer algorithms. It's wonderful that a GPS brings us you know, this morning to this conference center to the United Nations University. You can find it anywhere on the map. No. But also it disempowers us. It takes away our capacity to navigate ourselves. No. So this is the world in which we live, and the kind of education that we need for this world is a very different one than for the future. Once again, you know, we had that smartphone 10 years ago. Soon after, the digital world and the real world began to match, and everybody got connected. But some things that were very easy in the past became very difficult. Let me start with something very straightforward. You think about reading skills. Every teacher will say, well, I know how to teach people to read. You know, that's about a set of techniques, literacy to access knowledge, manage knowledge, reflect, and so on. But that was the literacy of the past. That was about extracting knowledge that had been written by someone else. And when you didn't know the answer to a question, you could look it up you know, in an encyclopedia, and you could trust the answer to be true. Most of what students read in the past was carefully digested. You know, the textbook they get in school were carefully reviewed by ministries and so on. And today, they live in this digital world. Huh? And when they ask a question, they get 100,000 answers from Google, and nobody tells them what is right and what is wrong, what is true and what is not true. Literacy is no longer just about extracting and managing knowledge. It is about creating knowledge. It's about Navigating ambiguities, about making judgments, finding out what is right and what is wrong. And in the same way, we can say it's wonderful that technology connects us all, you know, social media, everything is sort of connected. But at the very same time, the reality is that it's actually harder for people today to embrace the diversity in our society. You know? Technology, social media connect you with people who are thinking like you, who look like you, who are like you. It is actually, school used to be the first place for most people to experience the diversity in society. And that's where you meet people who are different from you. You learn different ways of thinking, different ways of working. And technology works in the opposite way. No? So that is why even very traditional things, no, literacy, numeracy, have got a very different meaning in the world in which we live and are much, much harder to teach. No? Let's think about this for a moment, what this means. In the past, you know, education was, you know, isolated from the rest of the world. We put, you know, students into school and the world outside. No. Students actually are very good in keeping students inside school and the world outside apart from school. No. We had a clear division of labor, what everybody's doing. No. Today it's about a shared responsibility. Team Gakugei, as they call it in Japan, you know, how can teachers work with other forces in society, with other types of stuff, together to address the needs of children? How can the social and the educational function become one? The traditional approach to analyze was, you know, we put something into the system and we're going to get something out. Today, we need to look at much more carefully at the process of learning. How do different students learn differently? How do I actually know not only my subject as a teacher and how students learn that subject, but 
How do I know my students? How they are different? In the past, you know, there was a static curriculum with linear learning progressions. We teach everybody in the same way. Today, we need a very dynamic approach to learning. In a way, you know, that distinguishes us a lot from the medical sector. If you are in, you know, the health sector, the first thing that you do is, you know, you look at people. You take their blood pressure, their temperature, you try to understand what is sort of happening to them. And then you try to find a medicine that is right for them. And you know, later you follow them very carefully. In education, we still give everybody the same medicine. No? And then we just wait and wait and wait and hope things will be okay. No? It's no longer good enough. We need those kinds of transition to do this no? in the education society 5.0. And at the heart of the education of the 20th century, is what we call student agency. The capacity to do, the capacity to mobilize our cognitive, social, and emotional resources. Often we know what to do. Often we have the skills to do something. But can we actually mobilize our cognitive, social, and emotional resources to do something? That's the heart of education. And when you, when you start to think about student agency, you know, and it's not just doing things alone, it's also doing things together with people who are different from me. You realize the profound implications that it has for the learning environments, no? where students are not passive recipients of knowledge, but co-creators of knowledge. No? Where learning environments become dynamic, where students' learning is really at the center and not the passive recipients. No? But that's just uh, hard, and if you think about student agency, you know, we ask ourselves, how well is it embedded in today's curricula, or the curricula that are currently being designed? And you can see it varies. No? Even in countries that are geographically very similar. No? Compare, you know, Japan and China. In Japan, agency is happening, but it's in a very modest way in the intended curriculum. China is, at least in theory, in the intended curriculum, very present. Look also how it distributes by different school subjects. In some school subjects, we are very good to deal with agency. In others, actually, much less so. There's no reason why agency should play a smaller role in the sciences than it plays in the humanities or in physical education. Physical education is a great place where you can learn to take responsibility for yourself, responsibility for others. Science as well. Now, why should students listen to an experiment when they can design an experiment? Those are the questions of our time. You can see big differences across countries, but in most countries, the bars could be longer if we want to make student agency really the core of education, and it has consequences. In fact, you know, one facet of student agency is the belief in our ability that we can actually change things, that we can do things. And you can see, again, that's where you know, the mirror image of the curriculum is what we see in those outcomes. Again, when I look at the results in Shanghai and China and Japan, they're almost on opposite sides of the spectrum, on the horizontal axis. On a vertical axis, I put the outcomes in mathematics. Self believes in mathematics and outcomes in mathematics. Do I believe that I can change things? No? That I have the capacity to solve un impossible problems? Where I do, I'm much more likely to succeed in a field like mathematics. No? So agency is not just some abstract idea, some concept for the 21st century. It's something that has very real consequences on our capacity to solve problems today. No? But that's only one part of this. The question then comes, how well are teachers equipped for those? In our TALIS survey, we survey teachers about their pedagogical activities. And you can see here, for example, in most countries, the dark bar is the average, you can see we do a lot when it comes on you know, traditional instruction. Teachers are very confident and comfortable with an environment that is about you know, traditional teacher-directed instruction. Classroom management is also a very important kind of set of activities, no? which teachers do and where teachers feel comfortable. But when you look to enhanced activities here, now for example, get students they believe they can do well, help students value learning, help students think critically, the bars get shorter. No? And when it comes to sort of supporting student learning through new technology, the bars get even shorter. No? 
you can see that the reality in the minds of teachers is still quite far away from this idea of student agency that has become so important. And that really got us to develop the OECD learning compass. Agency at the heart, but then it is, you know, about the knowledge of people, the skills, the attitudes and values. Let me sort of make a few remarks on this. When it comes to knowledge, disciplinary knowledge is always important. Do we understand the foundations of the discipline? But there's a deep shift for away from content knowledge, no? I know something, towards conceptual understanding and epistemic reasoning. In a world of today, you know, science changes very rapidly. What I learned yesterday, the content may not be relevant tomorrow. Everything is put into question. But can I think like a scientist? Can I design an experiment? Can I distinguish questions that are scientifically investigable from those that are not? No. Those are the enduring features of science. No. If I do not have a deep understanding of science as a discipline, Google will be worthless for me. It's going to be a big trash can because I cannot sort and sift that information. Can I think like an historian? Same thing. No. Often in school, we learn a lot of you know, numbers, dates, people, places, where we talk about history. But again, the question is, can I think like an historian? Do I understand how the narrative of a society has emerged, how it has developed, advanced, and sometimes unraveled when the context changed? What does it mean for the time in which we live today? No? Thinking like an historian, thinking like a philosopher. No? People who are good to understand the foundations of the disciplines and who can think across the boundaries of disciplines. No? They'll be the one who's going to master the content knowledge of tomorrow. People who are just taught the content knowledge of today will have difficulties tomorrow when they struggle with knowledge. No? So knowledge is not becoming less important. No? Some people say it's all about skills to do it. That is not true. Knowledge will remain important, but there will be a shift in the type of knowledge that will help us Mastering the future. No? And actually, here's a nice chart illustrating this. No? Some people say, well, memorization is always important. Yeah, it is for some things, but actually memorization can be counterproductive for a lot of other things. And in our PISA assessment, we looked at this carefully. When the problems become more and more complex, you can see how memorization actually hinders you from solving problems. If you deal with a problem that requires mathematical reasoning, mathematical modeling, and you expect that problem to have a single solution that you can remember, you'll never find that the answer to that problem. No. Elaboration strategies are the key to success in the 21st century. No. Can I connect what I know with what I don't know? Can I expand my knowledge? Can I extrapolate from what I know and use my knowledge in a novel context? No. You can see that very clearly. And, but as you could see before, that is where teachers often struggle with. No? And also, that's something where we can see big differences across countries. In some countries, that's quite present in the learning strategies of students and others. Still a long way to go. But let me turn to the skills dimension. Now, when we talk about skills, the first thing that people think about is, you know, cognitive skills, creative thinking, critical thinking. They're very, very important. But as you have seen in the chart before, what's actually rising most rapidly in the demand are the social and emotional skills of people. That's distinguishing us most from the artificial intelligence of computers. Creativity, some people believe that's the domain of humans. Actually, computers become pretty creative already. They can create solutions to a chess game that humans have not thought about in hundreds of years. Creativity is possible. But social and emotional skills are really important. And we have done something really interesting. And you are the very first people to see these charts. Now, where we actually tested the social and emotional skills of people and looked at how they actually predict outcomes. And you can see, for example, the cooperative classroom climate. Every teacher dreams of a cooperative classroom. Now, you can see it has to do with the capacity of people to cooperate, to be creative, to be curious, to have a sense of self-efficacy, emotional control. Empathy, metacognition, optimism, trust. No? Where we are able to develop those kinds of knowledge and skills, classrooms, climates are better. No? So it's not, you know, 
cl classroom climate will improve if I, as a teacher, impose more discipline or think about the environment sexually, but strengthening social emotional skills of people. No? Bullying in school is negative related with the same kind of social emotional skills. No? Not with all, but with most. No? Developing stronger social emotional skills will be a good guarantee to actually limit the incidence of school bullying. Better focus. No? Every teacher wants their students to focus, to learn with you know, concentration, to be persistent. And again, that has something to do with the social emotional skills. And what's interesting, you know, we tested the students, of course, but we also asked their parents and we asked actually the teachers. And what was so interesting that, you know, the judgments that parents and teachers said were actually quite similar with the results that we got from students. That was one of the most interesting findings that actually the observation, what we can quantify and what we can observe is actually beginning to match on this. No? Uh, closer social networks, no? also that, you know, the capacity of people to collaborate, to compete, connect, you know, actually again, something that's very important to uh, social skills. That's why, you know, when people talk about soft skills, I always get, you know, anxious because I think, you know, actually, I think science is a soft skill. No? What I learned in science, I actually studied physics. No? Most of that is irrelevant today, has evaporated because new knowledge has been created. No? But the social emotional skills, they actually remain. No? And sometimes they, they become you know, personality traits, character qualities. No? They're very resilient, very, very persistent over time. No? And you can see actually they matter for the world around it. Higher academic aspirations, no? same things. People who have a stronger kind of sense of their selves, the kind of environment, are more likely to aim higher in life. And this actually can overcome social disadvantage. We see in our data that those kinds of skills actually help disadvantaged children to break through that cycle. Entrepreneurship. I could make this list a lot longer. We have a lot of really interesting data that we're going to publish very, very soon about it that hopefully will highlight that we're not talking about a small byproduct of education, but really one of the foundations. And again, when you look at the reality, you can see, yeah, we talk about it. Those kind of things are often embedded in curriculum design. But when it comes to sort of uh, what is actually happening, the world is still quite far away. Keep also this in mind. Some of those social emotional skills can only be developed in certain windows of the development of people. So if you look, for example, emotional control is something that we can best develop between the ages of one and three. Later on, actually, those things do become character qualities. Suggesting that you know, the early years are of particular importance for the success of people. Now, in the learning compass, we've asked ourselves one difficult question. You, know, you can make long lists of knowledge, skills, attitudes, and values. But if you have to make choices, what are the most essential ones? We've come to three classes. The first is an obvious one. It's the capacity of people to imagine, to dream, to create something of intrinsic positive worth. Creating new value, we call it. But equally important is our capacity to manage tensions and dilemmas. No? The world is no longer black and white. Often we have to resolve you know, conflicting viewpoints, aspirations. No? And then last but not least, taking responsibility, mobilizing our cognitive, social, and emotional resources. And that also is embedded in the values of people. Sometimes people say, well, you know, values is where things get really complicated. Let's leave that to parents or, in, or individual teachers. Well, I think modern education systems will need to think much harder about values in education. Where people don't build a very solid floor under their feet, and that's about values. Many people will end up building walls around them. Now, that's when people sort of lose that kind of foundation. Now, what are the implications of, for pedagogy? Let me conclude with this. The first is about openness. We call it anticipation. Why do I say this? Because it's actually something very, very hard in education. We are very good in transmitting what we know to the next generation. That's what education is best in. We are not so good in actually creating that openness, the inner awareness for the new. Not to transmit knowledge to the next generation, but to have the next generation question the established wisdom of our times, to be open to the novelty. No? Sometimes it's actually quite easy to learn things. What is much harder is to 
unlearn things and relearn things when the context changes. No? We get very entrenched in our habits and you know, beliefs and actually challenging them is, is hard for people. No? The second point is about reflection, no? being able to step back to see the bigger picture, to see the forest among the trees. Very important these days. No? We are inundated with knowledge and information, but our capacity actually to make sense out of this, to see the bigger picture, the structures is very important. And then once again, action, the kind of reflection on agency. So what I, the lessons I draw from this, and let me conclude with this, is when we think about the future of education, of course it's about rigor, it's about cognitive activation, being demanding for students. That's clearly something that we can see across most successful systems. It's about focus, no? teaching fewer things at greater depths, giving teachers more space to actually get to the depths of the discipline rather than filling students up with surface content. No? It's about coherence, understanding more clearly at what stages of education students learn what best. No? Neuroscience, I think, is opening up amazing kind of possibilities here. Remaining true to the disciplines, no? that's very important. No? being able to think like a scientist, think like a philosopher. But at the same time, strengthening interdisciplinary understanding, helping students to see through the boundaries of discipline. Focusing on things that people can learn in novel contexts, being prepared for the future. Having learning environments that are authentic, and which is, I mean, theme-based, problem-based, project-based. My learning is truly co-created in a problem situation. And then, last but not least, always remember that some things are not taught. They are caught. For future teachers, it's going to matter perhaps less what they say, but it's going to matter more who they are. The challenges are tremendous, but at the same time, we are seeing many solutions all around the world. And actually, in just a moment, we're going to hear from students, from teachers, from superintendents and school principals how this vision is becoming a reality. Thank you very much. シュライヒア局長、どうもありがとうございました。今一度大きな拍手をお願いいたします。続いて、ただいまシュライヒア局長から紹介になりました。ラーニングコンパス 2030学びの羅針盤2030の向かう先はどんな未来であるのかこれからの未来を担っていく若者たちがどのような未来を作りたいと思っているのかそのためにはどのような力が必要と考えているかについて海外の生徒からのビデオメッセージをご覧ください The future we want is really taking in the student voice in that. So we're going out, asking our peers, asking our classmates, our sisters, our brothers, everyone basically, what they want for the future, and creating that into one big narrative, which we then bring here at the meeting. So the reason why we want to create a student voice in the form of the future we want is that the future we want is basically a promise. That's what the end goal is. Is that we want to display and kind of make tangible all of our dreams and hopes for the tomorrow, um, for our future and also for all the futures to come after us. Value students, value the youth. Um, the, a typical quote I know a lot of people my age say is that youth are only 25% of the population but we're 100% of the future. So I've noticed that if you don't value students and youth in talk about education and the future, then you are basically excluding us from our own future. And that decision, it, uh, it's not uh, co-created at all, it's not sustainable. So sustainability needs to be at the forefront of education and change. And yes, students and youth are the answer to our problems. <laughs> uh, they are yeah, they are the change. Okay, so when, when thinking about how education should be in the future, um, uh, I think that 
where, where it goes wrong is when adults think about what the future should look like, when adults think about what education should look like for the students, when there's no communication between the two, there's no like loop of, of feedback, there's how are you gonna create an education system that works for the students if you don't work with the students. As we spoke about uh, co-agency, you know, making classes engaging for the students and the teachers, it doesn't have to be necessarily the teacher teaching, it can be uh, uh, just a, a collaboration. You can have the students present and lead the class for a bit and, and show their case study, for example. It, it, I think rethinking education in terms of um, getting the students out of the, the seats, out of the classroom and, and be active citizens and participate and not wait until they are grown-ups to participate. I think that's the most important thing. I think the students are very important to help the other students. Not just not, oh the teachers are bad. No, it's not like the students need to help the other students, not just the teacher or the dad or the mommy or daddy or, you know, you know. So the future we want in general is because what we want for education in the future is that it is going to educate for the future. It is going to create individuals who are prepared for whatever might rise that we can't see right now. So what we see that is really unity about is our dreams and hopes for the future, even though that our current standpoints may be very, very far from each other, both geographically, culturally, or just politically. Um, but within the students, there's a great unity of what we want. And I see a whole lot of passion and energy from all the students participating here, which I'm really happy about. We need to leave, we need to, to to know uh, what is the real world, not the the, the block uh, when uh, we have a pen and uh, and a paper we write. It's not a real world. It, it, uh, this type, this block, it's uh, it's uh, it's uh, a space when I when do we we catch the, the knowledge. But in this in the other side, we have the problems. We have. Uh, sometimes uh, the the students don't have uh, a, a, a family. It's, it, it, it's happened. Uh, don't have a family. Don't have the, the conditions to 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 have a life uh, with health and with happiness. And it's, I think it's very important the emotional skills. In, in Portugal, the the most important thing to, to do in in our educational system is to change something uh, about the final exams that it's too much for us like three years it's a valued in three hours in a class sitting writing uh, just for that moment that count that like determines our life forever school is very important but the other things it's important to to uh, to have a mental head uh, more healthy to to do to, to the knowledge and the to live to live yes <laughs> my thing in education is that students and teachers can learn together together not like teachers teaching students the answers but to figure, figuring out the answer or the solution in issues together mm, I think it'll cultivate students the skills to think think about solutions like not for not with one approach but with many various ideas and I think that'll um, I think that's the skills that students or children will need in the future um, I think maybe focus less on the curriculum as of the subjects we, we need to learn but not really learn we memorize them but we need to focus more on developing certain skills, certain competencies that we need to have as future workers because um, we get out of the military school at the 12th grade uh, not really knowing how to be an adult, not really knowing how, how politics work, how we have to pay taxes. So that's definitely a key issue that needs to be implemented in school because if they are trying to form us as citizens, they should teach us citizenship. Um, and also, um, 
I think less, not less evaluation, but like more self-evaluation, because they will develop competencies such as leadership and autonomy, and more engagement between the teachers and the students, creating a relationship based on trust and confidence that will motivate each other. いかがでしたでしょうか。続いてラーニングコンパス2030学びの羅針盤2030で示された様々な概念や資質能力が育つ教室の実践を福井県立若狭高校及び福島県立双葉未来学園の生徒及び教師の皆さんから発表をいただき
I have become strongly committed to creating a better future in Takahama Town and to doing something for my hometown. I think this is an example of what the OECD Education 2030 suggests as agency. I think agency can be a small seed at the beginning, but it grows in time through various experiences. At first, I thought it was important to learn more about my hometown, so I engaged in my field work, such as visiting many places and hearing real voice from people living there. For example, I visited an institution where people grow medical herbs. I learned that my hometown has a resource to improve health. Also, I interviewed a town hall staff and a member of tourist office. They told me that the number of tourists had decreased greatly when a convenient highway system was put in place, which put pressure to attract people not for convenience, but with their attractive contents. When I was reflecting on such contents, a librarian introduced me a book. It was about health improvement will create business opportunities and lead to local revitalization. I thought this was it. Japan has, a, has had the culture of toji. It is about taking a bath in hot springs and eating delicious food, which will heal our body and mind. The, this culture was developed more than 1,000 years ago. I came to think of connecting the two, better health and tourism, to attract visitors again to Takahama, which can help my town revitalize economically and socially. The idea of health tourism is that staying physically and mentally healthy leads to the real happiness. For me to come up with the innovative idea of connecting health and tourism, I had to have the foundational knowledge, such as the population in rural area in my social science class, and nutrition and health in my home economics class. Knowledge such as key concepts and big ideas help us to connect dots and create new knowledge. Also, meeting people outside school helped me to enrich my thoughts. For example, when I was trying to define the target group of the health tourism, a professional from a consulting firm advised me to target foreign visitors and to specify a target age group. So, I researched the interest by age groups and decided to target people in their 40s and 50s. They are likely to be more concerned about the health issues than those in their 20s whose interest would be more into fashions for tourism. However, I surely needed school teachers who elicited ideas for me and helped me to further these ideas. I was able to think out of the box thanks to teachers who concerned me with people outside school, taught me how to gain new knowledge, encouraged me, and continuously gave feedback on my work. Through this continuous cycle, my agency has grown. I have enjoyed my inquiry-based learning, but it is also really tough. For example, the process of defining an issue and designing a solution to the issue for my inquiry was tough. After defining the issue of revitalizing Takahama, it took me more than two months to come up with the idea of health tourism. Even after coming up with this idea, no one had the answers to my inquiry. That is, how can we attract more visitors to Takahama through health tourism? No textbook, no teachers had the answers. So I was often at a loss. But I didn't give up. It was thanks to my grown agency, my strong will and belief that I want to make a change.
I want to do something good in return to those people in my hometown to whom I have owed a lot since my childhood. My agency grew when those people support me. They also have to grow my self-efficacy by acknowledging my efforts, so I was able to continue my inquiry-based learning. In conclusion, I would like to highlight that agency does not have to do something big. It can be a small step, but it's a real action for our common good, for common future. Don't just think, but act. And the cycle of action, reflection, anticipation from the OECD Learning Compass 2030 helped me to grow my agency. Please look forward to hearing from Takahama Town about the health tourism in the future if my plan, tour plan gets accepted. I hope to welcome you in Takahama with my tour plan. Thank you. Hello, everyone. My name is Hisano Watanabe. I'm a teacher and the research director at Fukui Prefecture Works High School. Thank you, Misaki, for your wonderful presentation. As she emphasized in the part of her presentation, AAR Cycle Hostas Agency. This is not simply my professional observation, but this is supported by research evidence. For example, we analyzed what kinds of stages of inquiry-based learning are closely related to fostering agency. The results show that there is a statistically significant correlation between agency and reflection. In my view, reflection develops a sense of agency because through the process of reflection, Students learn to recognize their own thinking and to make sense of it and to find purposefulness of their own actions. This will help students to develop self-efficacy too. Of course, reflection is not everything. In order to develop student agency, the school curriculum should ensure sufficient time and opportunities for students to design a project in which they learn to be a questioner, identify a research question based on their authentic inquiry, and learn to suggest solutions to their own inquiry. For students to do this, it's necessary for teachers to develop certain competencies to support the students. Also, it's necessary for certain environments, including curriculum, need to put in place to support teachers. Let me explain how the curriculum development is managed at Wakasa High School. Wakasa High School is a public school with four divisions, international division, science division, general division, and marine division. It means our students are very diverse, including ones who want to become a doctor or a fisherman. For all of these students in all grades, we provide inquiry-based learning. Students take it one hour per week. This is the minimum hour set in the Japan's national curriculum. The main objective of our inquiry-based learning is fostering students' ability to identify and formulate issues and to challenge in our community. Based on each student's interest, we expect students to analyze the current social situation with its background and to set hypotheses. This ability includes agency, which is suggested in the OECD's Learning Compass 2030. Wakasa region is located far from Tokyo and even far from the center of Fukui Prefecture. There is no university in my town. It means Wakasa has weak financial and academic resources. However, it doesn't mean bad to our inquiry-based learning. We have very rich natural resources. 
Many students work on their inquiry project related to the nature, such as microplastic problems affecting marine species. Our social and economic challenges in our region, as Misaki presented as one example, provide us a lot of opportunities for inquiring. There are three laws expected for teachers. First, teachers should help students to see how subject knowledge can contribute to solve real world problems. For example, Misaki used the knowledge from the social scientists and home economics. Teachers encourage students to connect their inquiry theme with their subject knowledge in order to expand their views and ideas. Second, the important role of teacher is connecting adults outside of school with students because the selected themes by students are, are very diverse. Teachers cannot teach each of these details. People from local government and our local community, school alumni, and parents are willing to support our students with their professional experience and advice. Using this type of social capital doesn't cost much. We are very proud of having this good social network with many adults who are willing to help students and work together. This represents co-agency suggested on the learning compass. Third, the most impactful role of teachers is accompanying students and keeping them encouraged. As Misaki mentioned, inquiry-based learning is really tough. Even a good student like Misaki, she spent two months to identify her inquiry theme. Many other students also struggle to find the theme of their inquiry, and even after they define the theme, their struggle continues for exploring solutions to their inquiries. It's teachers who can accompany these students and encourage them to keep working in order to grow student agency. Teachers play a key role. In order to support students better, teachers collaborate. We organize a teacher meeting once a week within the work hour to discuss and design lessons together. Teachers understand each other in a personal level. This enhances opportunities to develop co-agency among teachers. In addition, the experience of inquiry-based learning with diverse people motivates teachers to challenge implementing inquiry elements in their own subject classes. It expands teachers' views about pedagogies and enriches subject-based lessons. What would be the expected roles for school leaders in achieving these results? Fortunately, we have a very good school principal in our school. He listens to teachers' company and support teachers as we do it for one stu our students. He is trying to create open atmosphere in our school to encourage teachers to communicate and learn each other. This helps developing trust among teachers. Teachers and school leaders share visions and strategy to create innovative education for our students. These initiatives by teachers supported by school leaders led us to successful results. In this spring, university entrance results in Wakasa High School were significantly improved, including entering top university in Japan. The students from the international course who apply to admission office exam pass it with 100% success ratio. The inquiry-based learning can provide positive effects on the university entrance exams, which is evolving in Japan. I hope that our efforts can contribute to the development of education around the world. Let's improve the world's education together. Thank you so much for your kind attention. さん、
双葉未来学園をこの春卒業し現在は新潟大学1年生の遠藤亮さんと双葉未来学園の南郷一平副校長から発表をいただきますそれではよろしくお願いします Today I would like to share my experience developing the types of competencies the OECD Learning Compass suggests, such as in the transformative competencies. Let me start by introducing myself. I am from Okumatan, Fukushima Prefecture. My house is located five kilometers away from the Fukushima nuclear power plant. The 2011 Great Earthquake and the followed nuclear plant incident forced me to evacuate from there. Today, the evacuation order is removed for some parts of the Okumata, and some residents are moving back. The recovery from the incidents is surely progressing, but I still have not gone back to live in my house in Okuma. My aspiration is to go back to Okuma and live there in future. To do so, decommissioning the nuclear plant is mandatory. So I wanted to learn about how the decommissioning is handled. I entered Futaba Future School because I wanted to take its unique course called Inquiry-Based Learning to Create a Future. This course gave me opportunity to participate in many forums about decommission. Through the experience with a lot of such forums, I felt communication among the participants was not working well. First, most participants were always the same people. Second, these forums, especially the official ones, were chaired in a very diplomatic way. Last, it was always one-way communication from experts to residents. Of course, the decommissioning is very technical and highly political, so it's a difficult issue for ordinary people. But I believe residents should be involved in decision-making process because it affects their everyday life. So I selected this theme as the focus of my inquiry-based learning project. Through my project, I felt that the most critical issue is the treating water. Technically, Experts explain that the risk from releasing the tritium contained water to the sea is low for health, and other countries release it from their nuclear plants to the sea. However, when it comes to the tritium water from Fukushima nuclear plant, it is treated differently. Negative rumors damage life of fishermen or residents, and economically and socially. So we need to discuss the tritium water issue not only on its technical aspects, but also on social consequences. But in reality, I found no one around me did not know much about the issue. Even people who knew a little about it thought that it was a fisherman's issue, not theirs. And the fisherman did not want to be forced to make decisions because the sea belongs to everyone. This situation looked to me that no one wants to make the decision and take the responsibility for the decision. I questioned myself, who should discuss this issue besides experts, so that we can get out of the stuck situation and create a better future? This is very similar to the OECD transformative competencies, creating new value, taking responsibility, and reconciling tension and dilemmas. I came up with an idea of involving high school students in an open round table discussion about decommission. Because first, I thought high school students should know about the real issue of their future. Second, high school students are neither experts, fishermen, or residents, so we don't have vested interest in particular views. So I thought we could be bored to discuss sensitive issues more openly, for which we will be responsible after all. Organizing an open round of travel discussion sounds easy, but it was very difficult to do. The biggest challenge was to involve ordinary people 
who usually don't participate in this kind of discussion. They usually don't know, bring on the real this discussion are organized and are reluctant to go in formal settings. So we chose a venue in a free space at a supermarket in order to make them feel easy to join the discussion. We displayed posters at the supermarket and announced the events through SNS and personal networks. Eventually, about 30 people, including high school students and ordinary people, besides nuclear experts and people on the Tokyo Electric Power Company, participated in a round table. The purpose of this round table was not to convince others, but to share and understand uh, values and ideas with each other. We asked the participants to talk openly as an individual without representing a level such as Tokyo Electric Power or Residents. The round table went very well with active and intimate discussions. It was better than any other forums I have attended. Through this project, I learned a lot about technical knowledge from experts. And I found that the basic content was related to what I learned in my physics class. So I felt studying physics in school is important in real life issues. Also, I was able to have a vision for my future. My future aspiration is to become a scientist who can be trusted by people in the community and contribute to Okuma's recovery and development and also to the world. I hope to see you somewhere around the world. Thank you for listening. Thank you, Ryo. My name is Ippei Nango. I'm vice principal of Taba Future School. I worked alongside with Ryo his decommission project. The first of all, I'd like to my sincere appreciation to delegates from Argentina. The rugby World Cup is going to start this month in Japan. <laughs> Thank you. And the national team from Argentina selected Hirono Town, where our school is located as their base camp. Back in 2002, the national soccer team also stayed in our town for the FIFA World Cup. Our community people get powers from these events. We thank you for Argentina team for your continued attention for Fukushima. Thank you. Um, I would also like to my um, sincere my appreciation to Andreas for your advice through the OECD Talks group, with which we try to contribute to rethinking education with other OECD countries and G20 economies. Our school provides an example what can be done starting from scratch after the 2011 nuclear power plant disaster. So, as you can see, Rio has developed his agency through his inquiry-based learning. What is worth noting is that not only for Rio, but also his teachers, community, municipality, and government officials have learned a lot from his project. He was a catalyst for change to our community. He presented his project's outcomes at the International Nuclear Decommission Forum organized by the Japanese government and participated with their one of the panelists together with William Magut, the Director General of OECD Nuclear Energy Agency. Mr. Magut highly praised his project for its emphasis on the importance of community involvement. Decontamination is a very sensitive topic. Therefore, the first and most important role expected of teachers was to try not to manipulate him. We also try to manipulate a uh, no-no. <laughs> 
we also try to prevent from uh, other, other adults from manipulating him. We sometimes see cases where adults use students' voice for some campaign. The second role for teachers was to become a bridge. Teachers try to connect Rio with information and people outside of school so that he can explore his inquiry-based learning with diverse perspective. The third role of teachers was pushing him forward. When we explore an issue which has no clear solution, it is very natural for anyone to shine away and become hesitant to take action. So the role of teachers for students facing such situation is to acknowledge that no one has the right answer for their inquiries. Encourage them to move forward, work with them, and learn with them during the course of their learning. Futaba Future School was established five years ago with a mission of developing innovators who can revitalize the region as a creative and sustainable society. The first thing teacher did was the setting competency goals that were specifying types of competencies we want to develop in our students. Based on the lessons learned from OECD Talk School, we created a rubric. Our school competency goals include, for example, critical thinking and creativity, responsibility, active participation in the society. They are similar to the transformative competencies defined by the OECD Running Compass 2030. In order to develop these competencies, we introduced an intensive integrated study called Inquiry-Based Learning to Create a Future. Students are expected to identify challenges in our region and suggest solutions and take action to overcome these challenges. The key feature of this course is that students spend three hours per week for two years for project-based learning, which is typically more hours and a longer time frame than the average hours and duration set by other schools. In this course, all students define their own project team. Selecting a team of their own interest is the first big challenge for them. Without asking them to select a team quickly, we ensure six months for students to identify a team, which they really want to carry out from their heart, something they will want to pursue for the rest of their lives. The theme of their projects are, for example, working a tour guide for visitors from other countries to introduce Fukushima to the world, or producing a agricultural project, products using vegetables or fruits from Fukushima. We consider that this course as a core of our curriculum, not as an add-on. The agency you demonstrated today cannot be developed only within subject-based learning. There are some competencies which can be developed when facing actual challenges in real society, meeting professionals in the real world who are also struggling to overcome these challenges, students take action towards their own ideas by themselves and experiencing both successes and failures firsthand. Students experience synergistic learning going back and forth between this integrated course and subject-based learning. 
Through the experience in the integrated course, students can find the purpose of learning and become motivated to learn subject matters. Also, when students undertake their project-based learning in the integrated course, they are given the opportunity to apply the knowledge they acquired in the subject classes. Therefore, they will deepen the understanding of the knowledge in their subject classes. The embedded connection between the integrated course and subject learning is a key element of our curriculum. We are confident that our curriculum helps students to develop agency. This goes not only for you, but also for other students. Our research shows that 80% of students who graduated this spring say that they were able to find ways to live as an active citizen. And 90% of students were able to find a vision of the future they want to strive in. I want to highlight that agency can be sufficiently developed within a school curriculum without overloading students by adding specific courses about agency development. When we launched our school, some teachers argued that it's better to reduce the time allocated for this integrated course because it is difficult to measure its outcomes. Others wanted to spend more time to, on teaching knowledge, which could help students to get better scores in university entrance exams. However, today, all teachers are very confident and very proud of our curriculum because they witnessed how our curriculum helps students to grow students' agency and competency goals as we expected. Our curriculum is fully in line with today's national curriculum reform, and the Ministry of Education mentioned that the integrated course should be used to represent the mission of the school. They also suggest that the community and school should work together to provide students with inquiry-based learning through actual experience in society. So, you can see our curriculum is in full alignment with the national curriculum. Today, the Japanese national curriculum delegates flexibility and autonomy to school. So, it is important for teachers and school leaders to exercise our own agency to use this flexibility for maximum benefits for our students. For my own agency, of course, I face challenges. One, of, one example of a dilemma is to prepare students for passing for the university entrance exam or preparing students for life. The question is, would we want to work with a person like Leo who has acquired agency? As a member of our community to create a, create a innovation, our society? My answer is yes. But I wonder if current university entrance exams value such competencies and agency. I think it is our responsibility to address this. I do hope that the panel discussion following my presentation will address this topic today. Thank you. エンドさん、南郷副校長、どうもありがとうございました。発表された4人の皆様、どうもありがとうございます。
少しセッティングの時間をいただきます皆様大変充実したパワーポイント等をお作りいただいております今日はあもう最近の会議はすべてそうですが、えー、コンピューターの,あの取り扱いのお時間そしてえセッティングのお時間時々いただきながら進めてまいりますのでどうぞよろしくお願いいたしますさて今のセッションでは生徒さんがラーニングコンパス学びの羅針盤をどのように体得しているのかの体験と先生方がそのような学びを支援する環境をどうデザインしているのかまた教師方自身の学びの過程についても共有いただきました発表の最後に先生方からはそういった学習環境の改善に向けての課題や制度の改革への期待もお話しいただきました次の対談では麹町中学校の工藤校長先生と広島県教育委員会の広島県教育委員会の平川教育長そしてシュライヒャー局長にご登壇いただきイノベーションを起こす力を育む教育 OECD のラーニングコンパスでいう個人および社会にとってより良い未来を創造するために効果的なカリキュラムの実施にあたって求められる制度改革に焦点を当ててお話を伺いたいと思います。このセッションのコーディネーターはシュライヒャー局長にお願いします。Mr. Sierra Kaba, Mr. Kuru, welcome. You have a really tough job. You just heard what those students, what those teachers are looking for for the future of education, and all the eyes are on you to make it happen. And,、um, but, Mr. Kuru, long before the OECD talked about the learning compass, you were actually Living many of those ideas already in your school, when you think about you know, the cycle of、uh, reflection, of taking action, of being innovative. And so, tell us a bit about the vision of your school. Kojima Chugako, Kara Mai, Mr. Kudo, the Gozemas, Dozo, Yoroshiku, and Gashimas. えっと、まずあのうちの教育目標をちょっとまず最初にご紹介したいんですけどえここにあります通りえ平和的で民主的な社会を作る形成者を育成していきたいとまあ一言で言ったら持続可能な世の中を作っていくためのまあ人材育成をしていくってまあそういうことなんですねでまあこれを実現するためにえまあ3つの目標があるんですけどえ自立尊重創造と。えー、世の中を自分で考えて自分でこうあの判断して決定して行動できる、えー、子どもたちを育成することそれから多様なさまざまな人,人々を、まあ、受け入れて、えー、いくそういう力ですねでそして創造とでこれを、えー、具体的にもっとあの、えー、具体的にしたものがこの OECD の実は2003年の、えー、キーコンピテンシーですねあのデセコを使ったものなんですけどまあ、これをもとにあの作成をいたしました。えー、まあ自立という部分がえこの B にあたりますね。それからえ尊重にあたる部分が C にあたりますし、想像にあたる部分が A であると。で、これを子どもたちにさらにもっと具体的なスキルとして示したのはこの8つのえ目指す生徒像ということになります。えーでえー、とここから日本の教育の問題点に少しあの話を移していきたいと思うんですけど、えーとですね、日本の教育はです、ねまあ、文部科学省がまあ生きる力を育成したいと、えー、上にあるのが、えーまあ、自分で考えて自分で行動できるそういった自立した人間を育成したいでこれを、えー、具体的な手段として表したものが地域特育体育とこの3つにあたるんですけど。実はこの、えー、と OECD の先ほどのスキルとこの文科省が示しているこのものっていうのは、まあ、とても日本的でいいあのこの日本の目標はいいんですけど実はなかなか目指すスキルっていいますか子どもたちが身につけなきゃいけないものがなかなか不明確になりやすい、えー、ということなんです。でここをちょっと具体的に示してみたいと思うんですけど
、えー、自立した力を、まあ、生きる力を育成するためにその真ん中の学力にちょっとあの注目をしてみたいと思いますここですね。でそうすると日本の,あの多くの学校は、えー、こういった力ですね。えーできるだけ多くの知識を注入してそれを回答用紙というペーパーにアウトプットする力、まあ、どうしてもここに特化してしまうでこれを身につけさせるためにどんなことを行うかというと、えー、何度も繰り返して繰り返して例えば補修をやるとかですねノリルをたくさんやるとかそういったことでペーパーの力はアップさせるでも実はこれ最初の本当の目標ですね一番上の目標は自立をする人間自分で考えて自分で判断できる。えー、そのことを目指したはずなのに実はこの手段である、えー、真ん中の、えーえー、どうなんですか学力を高めるペーパーの学力を高めるとこ,ところに注目が行き過ぎてしまう、まあ、手段が目的化してしまうってことですねそうすると確かに、えー、繰り返せば学力はペーパーは上がるんですけど、えー、一番上の目標ですねこれを実は阻害している、まあ、損ねているってことになります。自立した人間を育成したいはずだったのに学力をアップさせることだけに注目したために実は自立を削いでいくこういったことが日本の多くの学校で行われているということになります。えーまあ、こういったところですかね Thanks so much. And、uh, like in our learning compass, this idea of、uh, student agency and co agency is really at the heart of your school's vision. But、um, I'll still be interested. How do you actually achieve the transformation towards this idea of agency? What obstacles and difficulties did you encounter, and how did you resolve them? えっとですね、あの実はそのまあ生生徒をどう改革してまあ変えていくかということと、まあ教員集団をどう変えていくかとは実はあのあんまり変わらないですね。ここにキーワードを、えー、いくつか挙げてみたんですけど。えー、当事者であるとかそれからえっ、ー、とあここにありますよねでここの,いあの4つのキーワードっていうのは簡単に言うと、えーまあ、民主的な考え方そのものなんですでえっ、ー、と私が最初にやり始めたことっていうのはたった2つのことですね一つは、えーまあ、全ての人間を当事者に変えていくなぜかっていうと多くの,、まあ、あの学校社会ではもう与えられ続けることに慣れているもういろんなものをどんどんどんどん与えていくそうすると与えられた子どもたちっていうのは与えられた内容にこう与えられたものにこう不満を言っていくんですね、えー、質が悪いとか例えばあの教員の指導力が悪いまたはカリキュラムが悪いともう一方的に与え,られ続けたも与え続けられたものをまあこなしていくっていうことがとても子どもたちの当事者意識を奪っていくってことですね不満しか述べないそういった子どもたちになっていく。でこれはあの、えーとまあ、学校の職員室も同じですね教員集団も全く同じです保護者も全く同じですねある意味で言ったら日本企業そ日,本日本の社会そのものっていうことになりますですからこの当事者意識を変えていくっていう作業がまず一つ大事っていうことですねでただこの当事者意識を変えていくっていうためにはじゃあどんなことをやればいいのかってことになるんですけどえっ、ー、と実は簡単なことを言えば一人一人の人間に、まあ、責任と権限、まあ、権限ですね創意工夫する権限を与えてあげればいい権限を与えてあげるってことをやればいいんですけどここでまた問題になってくるのが権限を与えるだけではそれぞれのこだわりに、えーえー、まあうんですかねこだわりに偏ってしまうってことですね、えー、自分の成功体験とか、まあ、過去の成功体験とか、えー、またはあのどこかの国の、まあ、こういったものをやればいいっていうその手段にこだわっていくってことですね、えー、そうするとさまざまなところでコンフリクトが起こして結局物事が決定しないということが起こりますでそこでもう一つが大事なところが目標を合意していくということですね、まあ、先ほどの最上位の目標を合意していくということから始めてでそ,こそれを実現するための手段その手段が上の目的と照らし合わせて問題ないかっていうその作業を一人一人ができるようにするということです。ちょっっとだけ例を持ってきました一番分かりやすいのでこれは日本の、えーまあ、運動会って分かりますかねあのスポーツフェスティバルって言ったのがいいのかなまたまた,また,また、まあ、スポーツそのものって考えてくればいいんですけど日本のスポーツ,スポーツはですね
ここにあのいくつか書いてありますけど何を重視するかというと多分日本人は間違いなくこれを言いますね協力するとか団結するとかですね、まあ、そういったことが大事だと言ってまあしまうんですでこのことをもう上位の目標に設定してしまうと、えー、みんなが協力したり団結することが目的になるので多くの,あの運動が苦手な子どもたちが学校来なくなったりするんですね、えー、楽しめなくなってしまうで,でこのことが起こらないようにするためにはもう一度本当に大事なものを、えー、みんなで、えー、対話をしていくことが大事ってことですねで対応するときに、えー、大事なものがこれですね、えー、民主的な考え方上にあるのは,、えー、み,んなはちみんなの考え方はも,ともちろん違っていいとただし、えー、下にある、えー、みんなの考え方は違っていいんだけどじゃあ全員にとって大事なものは何かまた全ての一人一人の子どもたちにとって大事なものは何かこれは相反する2つの概念ですけどこの2つの概念をえー、両立させる方向で対話をするこれが大事になってくるってことですねそうするともう一度これを考えるわけですね、えー、あなたは何がっていうんじゃなくて今度は全員にとって何が大事ですかっていうことを話し合うそうするとスポーツっていうのは上位に置かなきゃいけないものが見えてくるわけですねスポーツっていうのはもともと障害があっても障害がある人であってもなく障害がない人でもまた運動がうまくても下手くそでもうまくなくてもですねみんなが楽しめる、まあ、ここですね楽しめることが最上位でしょっていう合意ができるそうすると職員と子どもたちそれから保護者の間で最上に置くものが設定できると指導方法が変わってくるっていうことになるってことですね、えー、まあ,あの、まあ、そんなところですかねですからちょっと飛ばしちゃいますけどこれあの、まあ、子どもたちが対話を通して、えー、あの合意形成をしてるシーンですね。えーまあ、ここですねでこれ最後にこれ一言言った終わりにしたいと思うんですけど学校教育において最も大事なのは子どもたちが目標を実現させるために何か手段を選んでいくこの、えー、プロセスこのプロセスを経験させなきゃいけないそうすると学校教育で行わなきゃいけないのは子どもたちが当事者に変わるようなそういった教育システムを作っていくことが一つと一番大事なのは目標の設定ですね。最上位の目標をこれを間違えてしまうと対話が起こらないってことですねだから最上位の目標が必ず民主的に対話が起こるような目標を設定するっていうことがまあ最も大事になってくるまあそんなことだと思います Thanks so much it's so encouraging to see how actually these very complex and demanding ideas can actually become a reality in, a, in the school life and、um, I also know that you work on this not just on the basis of ideas, but actually that you use even the latest findings from neuroscience to develop the right pedagogies. And、uh, perhaps most importantly, you didn't, didn't say that, but your school also shows that 21st century learning doesn't come at the expense of traditional success in school, but can be the cause of traditional success of school. Your school is also one of the academically、uh, most successful ones. But,、um, Hirakawa san, I have a question for you. As a superintendent, everybody expects from you that schools are not successful despite the system, but because of the system. And sort of you have to create the enabling conditions and the support for schools actually to live those kinds of ideas, Mr. Kuro. Outlined.、Uh, tell us a little bit more about it. And particularly, I think you've highlighted in your work the pressure that exam also. Exam pressure that arises, and how to actually change the goalposts in education to create an assessment and exam culture that supports 21st learning. Hiroshima Ken, Kyo Yukchon, no Hirakawa to Moshimas, Eto, Kyo Yukchon, not the Kara, Ichi Nen to Go Kagets in Narimas. So no my wa this name, I know, Minkanji Kocho, the Yokohama no, I know, Chugako no Kocho at Torimasta. The so no my wa. えー、自分で起業してですね会社をあの経営しておりましたで今日あの、えー、広島県のですねまずあの目指すところの一番こう中学になるところの教育の対抗から少しお話をさせていただきたいと思いますえー、っとジェネラルポイントの下ですかねえー、っと対抗
えー、いろんなところございます、Each person will continue to learn activity というところなんですけれども、えー、一人一人がです、ね、生涯にわたって主体的に学び続け、多様な人々と共同して、新たな価値を創造する人づくりと、これが広島県の教育の対抗で、とにかくこれを1、えー、にも2にも目指していくとということでやっておりますで。新しい学習指導におきましては、主体的、対話的な深い学びというのを重視されてますけれども、えー、私も教育長になる前から、えー、学びの変変革という形でこの,あの新しい学習指導要領に準じた形で広島県の方は改革をしておりましたでもう一つですね非常に重要な、えー、点といたしまして教育のチョイスっていうのが私掲げておりますあのこの地域に住んでいてこの学校しかなくってやり方もこれでこういう学び方でやりなさいというふうに言ってたのが今までの日本の教育だと思います食べるものもこう着るものもすごく日本は自由なのになぜか教育だけが不自由だということをずっと思っておりましてこの教育のチョイスを広げるためにさまざまなオルタナティブなチョイスを作っておりますその一つがですねこの4月に開校いたしましたあの広島グローバルアカデミー、えー、広島英知学園でございます大変あの自然豊かなですね自然で、まあ、日本のエーゲ海と呼ばれております瀬戸内のですね海の風光明媚な、えー、島で開校いたしておりますダイバーシティを重視しておりまして、えー、1学年40人、えー、高等学校からは外国人も20名プラスされてインターナショナルバカロリアというようなことであの学んでいきますインターナショナルバカロリアというとやっぱりインターナショナルスクールで年間あの300万とか400万とか高いトゥイションを払うお子さんしか学習できないということがございますけど私どもは、えー、パブリックですのでフリーです、えー、授業料もタダで、えー、学ぶことができるという。いうふうなことが言えます。それからあの来年。のところからですねこの、えー、初等教育においてもイエナプランオランダのイエナプランを持ってきましてあのソサイティ 5.0 時代の新たな学び方のあり方として、えー、実現していくよう、あのー、今準備しております。えー、広島県教育委員会も義務教育指導課というのを2つに分けまして1つはルーティンワークの方もう1つは新規部隊という形で個別最適な学び担当課というようなことを置いてさまざまなその、えー、ソサイティ 5.0 に向けた学びの準備研究、えー、それからこのイエナプラン準備等を進めております、えー、こちらの方はあの去年はあごめんなさいこれ,これでえあれあこれですねごめんなさい、えー、とこちらの方はですね去年あのイエナプランの方あの見学に行った時のものをあの示しておりますそれから、えー、東大ロケットイン広島ということでこれはアクティビティベーストラーニングを、えー、趣旨としておりますけれども、えー、こういったチョイスもですねあの子どもたちにあの学校の一斉の授業じゃなくてこういう授業もあるんだよとこっちにも来てもいいよと出席扱いするよということでやっておりますでこのようにですねあの子どもたちの日々の学びを変えていく取り組みをしておりますけれどもやはり重要なのはですね義務教育から高等学校へそれから高等学校教育から大学教育へと入学者選抜がですね球体以前であるとなかなかこう、まあ、やろうと学校はしてるんだけれどもなかなか現実を追いついていかないというようなことがございますでそうした中で、まあ、この3月に文部科学省が進学習指導要領の趣旨を踏まえました児童生徒の学習評価の改善について通知を出されました、まあ、その中で高等学校の入学者選抜について進学習指導要領の趣旨等を踏まえた改善を行うということが指摘されましたのでこれ幸いということで、えー、今度はですね広島県の15歳の子どもたちにどのような力をつけさせたいかという根本的なところに立ち返りまして入学者選抜を、えー、改善する予定でおります。えー、スキームといたしましてはあのー、いろいろございますけれども、えー、っと一番分かりやすい例としてはこの調査書というものでございます。えー、この調査書イメージ湧かない方もいらっしゃると思いますので様式を用意いたしましたけれども私神奈川県で中学校長をやるときからこれやめたいと思ってましたなぜかと生徒がですね調査書の内申点をよくすることを意識するあまりこうひらめになっちゃうんですね先生の顔色ばっかり伺ってるそれから1年生の時に成績不振だった子が2年生3年生と上がっていっても3年間頑張らないといけないっていう仕組みだったりあるいは教職員にとってもあの非常にかあの過度な負担になっているということがございましたただこれやめるわけにはいきません、えー、昭和22年に作られました学校教育法施行規則において入学者選抜で活用することが想定されておりますので
、えー、やめるわけにはいきませんけども県の方で自由にこれは採択ができますそこで現場の校長先生方のご意見なども伺い聞きまして、えー、ちょうどですねこれ左から成績それから行動の記録それから出欠席、えー、インクワイアリーの授業の,あの記録えー、等等が載っておりますけれども、一番問題なのは行動の記録とか、その人のそのキャラクターに対しての先生の評価がここでなされてるってことなんですよ。これを全部、えー、やめたいなというふうに思っております。えー、それからアブセンスも、時間がいたからって言って学びができてるかってはそうではないと思います。えー、結果、多分これ残すのはラーニングレコードの一部というふうに、えー、今捉えております。えー、そうしたところからもですね、高等学校の入学,学者選抜を、えー、改善していくっていうことでですね、えー、より一層あの主体的対話的な深い学びの実現を、えー、やっていきたいというふうに思っておりますけれども、ぜひですね、文部科学省の方には大学入試制度改革の,あの変更も、えー、一刻も早くお願いできれば、高,高等学校の入学者選抜、それからあの大学っていうことで両面でできるかなと思ってまして、このシステムをやはり変えていくと、ところがあのまずはキーサクセスポイントなんじゃないかなというふうに思っております。以上です。Thanks so much for sharing this experience, and I think also <coughs> your emphasis on examination. I have just sort of one one small、uh, question to add to this, and、um, uh, Hiroshima has always been at the frontier in Japan in terms of developing kind of innovation ed education. Hiroshima is also a very strong player in the innovative school network、mm -hmm. that we have. And as part of that,、uh, you created an alternative high school, Aichi High School. And I, my question to you is yes, we can create alternatives to the existing system, but can we transform the existing system? How do we get the ideas into the regular school system?、Um, so,、um Yeah, since I was a、um, principal, I was thinking about that. So, the first of all,、um, I become, when I became the、uh, pre, uh, um, superintendent, I told to my staff, okay, I'm going to change. That's it. And then、uh, I don't know, see what's going on, and、uh, I don't know how to. Reform for everything, but、uh, this is one of the examples. But also, I have to change the everything, you know, the curriculum or,、uh, you know, how to,、um, how to, you know, become the、um, school system or、uh, so everything. But the most important thing is that the、um, education, choice of education is the most important thing. Even though the 5% or 10%, that's okay. That's going to be the you know, small step to change. Thank you so much. And unfortunately, we've run out of time, but I think you two are the living example that the learning compass can become real. Thank you again. Thank you.